Have a good Christmas, guys. Let me open up some prayer, and I'll bring up Hutch. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we invite you in. Uh, Father, we thank you that you are Elohim, Yahweh, in charge. <laughs> thank you for underscoring that for us. And uh, Lord, I pray uh, blessings over each man here, over the family. May Christmas be really special. And Jesus, may you be lifted up, because yes, from you is everything, and to you are all things. And so we worship you. And today, as we talk about the salvation that you bring us, help us to do that with a very worshipful heart. Uh, be with Hutch, and teach us, take us deeper. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, let's thank Hutch. He took on a big load this year. It's the last week for <laughs> Indispensable. And Hutch, thank you. Appreciate that. Everybody want to let uh, Ron know how much you appreciate him and his leadership for one thing. Love you. Appreciate you. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you. If you have a Bible, a phone, iPad, whatever you follow along with us in the Word of God in our study, and there's donuts at that table. Just wanted to point that out. That's a good table leader there to provide donuts for the table. Just saying, you know. Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, Ro keeping you in suspense. Romans chapter 5 is our text this morning. Romans chapter 5. And I have a question for you while you're finding your way over there. How many of you have ever gone Christmas caroling? Let me see your hands, okay? S most everybody in here, but some of you haven't. And so what I thought we would do is, is give you a chance this week to do what you have never done before. And uh, depending on how you do, we may take this show on the road over the Christmas holiday. So there's a familiar Christmas carol called Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Has anybody ever heard of that one? Maybe you sang in church or so. But uh, So if you would, I want you to go ahead and clear your throat. <clears throat> Get ready. All right. And we're going to sing this together, all right? We don't have an overhead. We don't have the handout. Uh, you don't want anybody else's voice to mess you up, Ron, and throw you off key. <laughs> I understand it. You ready? Here we go. Sing with me. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Stop. The reason I tell you to stop there is because of that last line. God and sinners reconciled. Romans 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. While we were enemies. Have you ever thought of yourself as an enemy? I doubt it. I mean, what you and I need to understand is, is when the word of God says that we are enemies of God, it's not talking about our feelings towards God, it's talking about God's feelings towards us. You say, Hutch, I, 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 I'm not an enemy of God. I mean, goodness gracious, I'm here on a Friday morning early. It's 32 degrees outside, and I'm with a bunch of men. I'm singing a Christmas carol, and I'm studying the Bible. I'm not an enemy of God. I actually go to church on Sundays. I give, I help little old ladies across the street. I am not an enemy of God. Well, according to the scriptures, you are. Psalm 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation. And that word indignation means anger. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation or anger every day. Now, turn back a page or two and Psalm chapter five, and we read these interesting words. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness or sin. For you're not a God who delights in sin or wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evil doers. What you and I need to realize this morning is, is that God's awesome holiness and his absolute perfect righteousness force him to view us as enemies, regardless of whether you go to church, regardless of whether you attend men's Bible study, regardless of if you help little old ladies across the street. Now, that's the bad news. But we have a gracious, loving, heavenly father who gives us good news. Again, let's go back to our text. 
while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God. Now we got to stop for a second and do a little word study. That word reconciled in the Greek is the word kalatasso. And it means, write this down, guys. See if you catch this. The word reconciled in the Greek means to change one thing into a completely different thing. It's to change one thing into a completely different thing. It's the idea of when you travel to a foreign country and you go up to the currency exchange uh, office and you take your American dollars and you turn it into euros if you're in Europe or pesos if you're in Mexico or wherever you are. It's to change one thing into something different. And that's precisely what God offers every human being alive. He offers to change his hatred and hostility towards us into friendship. He offers, he offers to make peace with us. That's reconciliation. And that's what God offers a human race, but there's more. Because in Romans chapter five and verse 10, we get the mechanism whereby God, a holy God, makes it possible for him to reconcile with us. Look at our text again. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Circle, highlight, underline these next six words, by the death of his son. By the death of his son. Now, it's interesting when we look at the pages of our New Testament, how many times we see the words through Jesus, through the blood, through the cross of Jesus Christ, in Christ, by Christ Jesus. Let me give you some examples here. You'll see them there in your notes. Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 and verse 20. And through him, that is Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, where, uh, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. How? By the blood of Jesus. Verse 21. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in what? His body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 14, in verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father, how? Except through me. Everything good that God offers to you and me as sinners, reconciliation, forgiveness of our sin, eternal life, the best quality of life here on this earth possible, all of that is offered to us through Jesus and his finished work on Calvary's cross. Why is that? How come we can't just come to God some other way? It's because Jesus' death and his shed blood on the cross did something that absolutely nothing else in this universe could ever possibly do. You say, what was that? It allowed God to stay true to his character as God, true to his holiness, true to his justice, true to his righteousness, and at the very same time, Jesus' death on the cross allowed him to extend mercy and grace and forgiveness to us as sinners. And that's so very, very important for you and I to understand. It's absolutely essential. So we need to unwrap that just a little bit more. Look at this next text there in your notes, Romans 3 and verse 25. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Now, just a quick question. How many of you in the last week have used the word propitiation in a conversation? Anybody, 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 anybody? Last month? Six months, year? All right. What does it mean? Well, I guess what? I'll tell you in just a second, all right? Hold your horses and you want to write this down. You're going to, by God's grace, learn something today. You'll be able to walk out of here and say, you know, it was good to be in the gymnasium of the Lord this morning because I learned something. You get that? That was a joke. Sorry. You got to, it's too early. All right, here we go. 
whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Now this word propitiation is really quite simple and it means something that satisfies another person. Propitiation is merely something that satisfies another person. A propitiatory sacrifice is a sacrifice that satisfies another person. What did Jesus' death on Calvary's cross satisfy? Two things. Number one, Jesus' death satisfied the justice of God. Jesus' death satisfied the justice of God, which demands that a death be paid for every sinner. And as the sinless son of God, Jesus paid that debt for you and for me. But there's a second thing that Jesus' death on the cross satisfied, and that was Jesus' blood satisfied the holiness of God. Jesus' blood satisfied the holiness of God, which demands that a blood sacrifice be made for every sinner. And as the sinless lamb of God, Jesus made this sacrifice for you and for me. Because both God's holiness and justice were satisfied, we're, we're propitiated through what Jesus did on the cross. You say, well, whoop de doo Well, you shouldn't because the, the truth of the matter is, is it's because of this that God is enabled to stay holy and just and righteous all the while being able to extend to us mercy and grace and forgiveness. God did not in any iota sacrifice or violate his justice to show us mercy because his justice was satisfied. God didn't in any way, shape, form, or fashion violate his absolute and utter holiness to show you and me mercy because his holiness was satisfied. Well, maybe you think to yourself, well, why couldn't just have anybody died on the cross and paid for sin? Well, it's because there's a little word that we've been using over and over again today that, that maybe it's slipped over your your head or pass by real quick. It wasn't possible for just anybody to die to pay our sin debt. The most important word here is the word sinless. Sinless. Look at Hebrews 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, circle, highlight, underline these next three words, yet without sin. In other words, Jesus could pay the penalty for sin for you and for me because he did not have to pay the penalty of sin for himself. Jesus could shed his blood for our sin because he didn't have any sin of his own that needed atoning for. The only way that this works is for the person who pays for you and me to not have to pay that penalty is for themselves to be without sin. And that only happens with a sinless person. And that only happens through the Son of God by the virgin birth so that he could indeed live a sinless life life. No other religion, uh, no other ism, no other ology, no other human system could achieve this perfect balance between both the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. Both sides of God's character are kept intact. He's holy, righteous, and just. And he can extend forgiveness of sin, give us eternal life, and the very best quality of life here on this earth because of his character. It's not been violated in any way, shape, form, or fashion. That's the dynamic 
of the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, guys, God had a conundrum. And his conundrum was, he loves you and he loves me. And you matter to him and I matter to him so much. But on the other hand, God wants to show us mercy and grace, but he is righteous and holy and just. And like any human judge, he can't simply turn his head and ignore guiltiness. So how do you solve that conundrum? You solve it by satisfying both parts of God's nature. And the only way to have done that was by the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And that, guys, is how salvation works. So that brings us to the question, what now? You say, Hutch, thanks for the last 10 minutes or so. I've got a, a little bit better understanding of, of my salvation and of how God was able to, to not have to um, deny any of his character. But what does that mean for me today? What difference does today's teaching make for me? Well, without a doubt, one of the cruelest forms of death that man ever created was the cross. And what you and I need to understand is, is that everyone who was impaled to a cross, and there were many, were also beaten to within an inch of their life before they were ever put on that cross. Yet in spite of all that, I want you to listen to what the Bible says. And this is one of the most amazing verses you will ever read in your Bible. As a matter of fact, you may want to go back and highlight it in your own Bible. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10. And look at what it says. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Some translations read, it pleased the Father to crush him. Not only was it the father's will, but the father was pleased that his son would be crushed. Why in the world would the heavenly father be in any way, shape, form, or fashion pleased that his son would be put into a mortar and crushed to the point of death? Because he knew that in the crushing and in the shattering of his one and only son, he would thereby be able to be reconciled with you, to forgive your sins, to present you to himself as holy and righteous. It was you and it was me. That's how simple it is. That's how much God loves you. And that's how much God loves me. And that demonstrates for us, puts on full display, how much God loves all of mankind. Not that he was just willing, but he was pleased to crush Jesus so that he could redeem you and me. We're going to take a break right there. It's getting a little intense. We're going to go through our questions around the tables. I'm going to come back on the back end. And it's just a couple minutes longer than usual on the back end. So if you have patience with us, we'll get back to it in just a minute. God bless guys.
All right, all right, all right. Guys, I want to tell you a story. It's a true story. Mother's Day weekend, 2007. I'm scheduled to do a baby dedication with 30 kids at our church on Sunday. On Saturday, our son Josh, who if you don't know our story, he's, now he's 33 years old, he was born with Down syndrome, he's the oldest of our four kids, he was not feeling well. Josh doesn't have the ability to tell you, oh, my, uh, my stomach is hurting or, or, or some different things like that to communicate. So we have to watch him and observe him. And we watched him throughout the day and he just wasn't himself. So we knew something was up. We got into the later evening hours and Cindy got very, very concerned. And uh, she asked me, do you think I should take him to the hospital and get things checked out? And like any man in this room, I said, well, give it a couple more hours and see. Well, she gave it about 15 or 20 minutes and then she made the executive decision, I'm taking him to the hospital. And so he's there in the hospital in coming and uh, they check him out. I'm at home with the other three kids because I got a big day the next day, right? Uh, Mother's Day at church is usually high attendance. Families come in, kids come in. We're dedicating uh, children, so they're all gonna come in. So it's a big day, but probably around 10 30 or 11 o'clock Cindy calls me from the hospital and said they have determined that Josh is in heart failure they are not able to provide the care that he needs and they are going to helicopter him down to Atlanta to Eggleston's Children's Hospital and so that's exactly what happens she gets in the car and drives down there um, I'm at home laying in bed, thinking about him and praying for him. He, uh, when they got there, they figured out he wasn't in heart failure, but he did have pneumonia and he was in the hospital for about five or six days. And I remember seeing him there and it's just a pitiful sight to see your son, uh, not himself, right? And he's got wires and hooked up all over the place. I've told you about the time he had open heart surgery and how that I had to do the second, first and second hardest things I've ever had to do in my life in that time. But now I was reflecting on this truth that we've studied today and I was reflecting on, on that time that Josh was there in the hospital. And I, I had to think to myself, who do I know that I love so much that I would be willing to let them do to Josh what they did to my Savior on their behalf. And I gotta be honest with you, I couldn't think of anybody. That I would be willing, that I would be pleased that my son would be crushed for them. Not for myself, not for my wife, not for my other children, certainly not for you or anybody. And I would venture to say your answer is probably the same as mine. Yet God loved you enough that he didn't just let somebody do that to Jesus. Do you know that he orchestrated it? Did you know that in the fullness of time he sent his only son to be crushed and it pleased him that it happened? And guys, that's how much God loves you and that's how much you matter to him. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what anybody else says. I want you to hear that today. God loves you. And you matter to him. And that's what Christmas is really all about. It's not about the lights and the trees and the tinsel and the decorations and the meals. Although... We love all of that, and we're going to have all of that at our house this year. 
we're excited about it in a fresh way with a grandson that for the first time will be able to understand a little bit about what's going on. He was at our house yesterday. He pulled out a, one of the presents. No, 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 Wes, not yet, okay? So he's starting to get excited about it. We get excited about it because it's fresh and new. But that's not what Christmas is really all about. Look at this next and last text in your notes. 1 John 4, beginning in verse 9. First John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest, or literally put on full display. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, there is our word, propitiation. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. If you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and I would expect that on a Friday morning this early, most of us, but I would be remiss if I assumed all of us know Jesus as our real and personal savior. If you're here today and you know Jesus as your real and personal savior, my prayer for you today, my prayer for me today is that we would be reminded of the great love wherewith God loves us and how important and how valuable we are so much so that he would take his one and only son and allow him to be beaten and battered, the beard plucked out of his face, to be whipped and then impaled to a tree suspended between heaven and earth to shed his innocent, sinless blood to satisfy God's holiness and righteousness and justice yet also to satisfy his great love, which brought us grace and mercy and forgiveness. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your real and personal savior, here's my prayer for you, that you would see this Christmas differently than any other Christmas that you've ever seen, and that you would see how much God really, really does love you. So much so, that not only would the Father orchestrate those events, but the Son willingly laid down his life. Therein, gentlemen, is real love. Would you close your eyes and bow your head with me? No one's moving, no one's stirring. If you're here today and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior, would you in this moment allow me the privilege of just simply leading you in a prayer? And I want to say this, there's nothing magical about this prayer. But if this prayer in any way, shape, form, or fashion expresses the sincere desire of your heart today, use your own words, but simply cry out and say something like this, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for stepping out of heaven, coming through the virgin birth, living a perfect and a sinless life, and dying a cruel death on Calvary's cross, shedding your blood for the forgiveness of my sins. Although I don't understand it all right now, as best I know how, Jesus, I invite you to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, to make me a brand new man. Help me to love you and know you more each and every day from this day forward. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share the good news. We started off with the bad news. We are all enemies of God. But we finished with the good news. And that is that you loved us so much that you sent your only son. That whoever would believe in him should not perish, would have everlasting life. I pray for those of us today who know you as our real and personal savior, that you would help us to make it our mission and our passion to love you more and know you better in this coming year. For that person today who 
prayed just to a moment ago to receive Jesus Christ. I pray that you would give them the courage and the boldness to share with myself, with Ron, with Tom, with our table leaders, so that we might be able to saddle up alongside of them and walk with them in this journey of growing in you. That's our passion. That's our mission. So Father, we thank you for loving us so much. Help us never, ever, ever, ever to get over it. And may we in this day, may we in this Christmas season, take this wonderful, great, good news that we heard about today and share it so that others may come to know you in a real and a personal way. And we will be sure to give you all the thanks and the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. It has been a great year. Next year starts in just a couple of weeks. We're back on uh, January 4th. We'll see you then. God bless. Thanks for letting me be a part of your life.